Sydney is the state capital of New South Wales and the most popular city in Australia. Sydney is a consistently high ranking world city for quality of life. It's ranked the second best city in the world in the 2013 Apple GFK City Brands Index. Today, we are going to introduce the city of Sydney on its tourism, transport, water, waste, and energy management, disaster relief, and also green building technologies. Tourism is a vital industry for Australia. Tourism 2020 is the Australian government's national long-term strategy for the tourism industry and lays out a pathway for it to reach its potential. To achieve this, there are a number of workforce, employment and skills development issues that need to be addressed. The Australian Tourism Labour Force Report, released in October 2011, estimated that there were nearly 36,000 unfilled tourism positions across Australia. By 2015, 56,000 additional people will be required to fill vacancies. Many of these vacancies are in Sydney. As a result, it has been classed as a tourism employment hotspot along with seven other areas in Australia. Tourism Employment Plans, TEP, are being developed for each of these employment hotspots. On behalf of the Labour and Skills Working Group, the Australian Government Department of Resources, Energy and Tourism, RET, has contracted the Stafford Group, a leading Sydney-based tourism strategist and advisory firm with extensive consulting experience throughout Australia, New Zealand, Asia and the Pacific to develop a Sydney tourism employment plan over 12 months. The Stafford Group is working closely with RET on the project in partnership with the NSW Department of Trade and Investment and Destination NSW. Below are what TEP will do. First, TEP confirmed the priority, region-specific, labour and skills issues. Second, TEP identify and deliver targeted measures to support capacity building. Third, TEP identify impediments to address the issues and explore viable region-specific solutions. Four, TEP responds to current gaps in available resources. Lastly, TEP provides an industry framework to guide the delivery of practical sustainable solutions that leverage existing government and industry programs. In Sydney Attractions, Sydney has an almost endless variety of attractions to entertain visitors of all ages. If you go to Australia, you should go to Australia's diverse wildlife, go behind the scenes at an art gallery, see a performance at the Sydney Opera House, immerse yourself at a museum, or visit a World Heritage listed convict heritage site in the heart of the city. At Australia's most popular tourist attraction, the famous Sydney Opera House, it's easy to spend hours exploring this World Heritage architectural wonder. You can join a behind-the-scenes tower, enjoy a meal or a drink at one of the many bars, restaurants or cafes and then see a world-class performance beneath the famous white seals of the building. A big city needs some big thrills, especially for family holiday makers. Introduce the kids to animals from around the globe at Sydney's Harborside Tarango Zoo or check out Featherdale Wildlife Park. A 40-minute drive from the centre of the city, featuring more than 2,200 animals, including little penguins, koalas, and kangaroos. At Sydney Aquarium and Ocean World, the kids will see Australia's beautiful marine life at close quarters. Wildlife Sydney at Darling Harbour features interactive displays, daily animal feeding sessions, and walk-through habitats, including koala encounters, the outback, and butterfly tropics. Other top Sydney tourist attractions include Luna Park, a fun pack, Harborside Amusement Park, and Sydney Tower Eye, the highest point above Sydney with breathtaking 360 degree views of the harbour beaches and, in the distance, the Blue Mountains. You can board a destroyer or squeeze into a submarine at the Australian National Maritime Museum at Darling Harbour. From Sydney Observatory, you observe the night sky and the stars of the Southern Cross. According to the Council, the draft strategy provides an overarching framework to inform its economic development initiatives and outlines of three major priorities for supporting the city's economy over the next decade.
First, yeah. the draft strategy strengthening Sydney's competitiveness by creating a city that encourages business investment, attracts international visitors, and has a lifestyle and culture residence. The draft strategy improved the productivity and capacity by investing in the infrastructure needed to keep the city moving, encouraging full workforce participation and supporting the growth of new sectors. Lastly, promoting opportunity. They support the development of vibrant and sustainable industries across the city and help them forge links with other sectors. There are few transport systems available in Sydney. First of all, is the commuter bus services. Commuter bus services account for about half of the public transport journey taken in the city on weekdays. Of the 921,000 weekday trips, 554,000 are provided by the State Transit Authorities of New South Wales, a government authority. The remainder by a large number of private sector operators. Next is the railway system. There are two types of railway systems available. The first one is the heavy rail. Passenger rail services within Sydney are provided by Sydney trains. Fares are calculated on the basis of distance travel. Sydney's suburban commuter rail system consists of 11 railway lines. Sydney does have, doesn't have a separate metro system, but most suburban lines run to the city centre. On most lines, there are two to four trains an hour at off-peak times. The next is the tram and light rail system. Sydney one has the Southern Hemisphere largest tram network. Petronage peaked in the 1945 at 405 million passenger journeys. The system was in place from 1861 until it winding down in 1950s and eventual closure in 1961. In the year of 1997, trams returned to Sydney in the form of short light rail line between the central and the inner west. The line is now owned by the Transport for New South Wales and operated by Trendis NSW. An extension in this line, in addition to a second light rail line, through the CBD and the eastern suburbs are now planned. When completed, this addition will result in almost doubling of current light rail system. Last but not least is the Sydney Ferries. Sydney Ferries is another state government-owned organisation, runs numerous commuter and tourist ferries on Sydney's harbour and the Parramatta River. Harbour ferries are used in equal measure by commuter and leisure users. Paramata River ferries are overwhelming use for leisure and tourist trip. Present, the city of Sydney area gets the bulk of its annual 33.7 million litres of drinking water from Waragamba Dam, 70 camps west of the city, and from the desalination plant in Kernel, 40 camps south of the city. During the last drought, Water levels at Waragama Dam fell to all-time low levels, including to just 32.5% in February 2007. Water transfers from the Shoal Hewan River prevented levels sinking to just 13%. Importantly, only half of the city's drinking standard water supply is used for drinking, bathing and cooking. The remainder is used for non-drinking purposes, flushing toilets, irrigating parks and running large-scale air conditioning, all of which could be serviced by recycled water. The sources of recycled water include storm water, groundwater, laundry water and wastewater. The city's decentralised water master plan concentrates on a range of other initiatives to source local water supplies, including building major storm water recycling projects at Sydney Park and Green Square to save up to 1 billion litres of water per year and reduce pollution of the Coats River. 2. Building rain gardens within strict caps to fill the storm water and reduce pollution discharge into strict ways. 3. Investigating feasibility of major storm water recycling projects within wetlands at Wentworth Park, Moor Park, Bicentennial Park in Glee, and Victoria Park at Broadway. Fourth, investigating feasibility of wastewater recycling projects at major development precincts such Green Square, Barangaroo, 
and Darling Harbour. The city has already increased local water use by installing rainwater tanks at nearly 20 childcare, kindergartens and community centres. There are also 20 stormwater harvesting and reuse projects completed or in planning to irrigate the city's parks and sporting fields. Completed projects include Sydney Park at St. Peter's, Surrey Hills Library, Kiruma Park in Paramount, Lillian Fallen Reserve in Newtown, Alexandra Oval, and Prince Alfred Park in Surrey Hills. Completed and planned projects are currently producing a total out of 5 million litres of recycled water each year. A number of parks are using local pool water which overall provides 27 million of water per year or 50% of total water use of city parks. The upshot of this commitment to diversifying the city's water supply is increased resilience in the face of the challenges of climate change and a growing population, as well as cementing a more sustainable environment. As for the waste management, the waste collection in Sydney used to work like this. Homes and businesses place their container full of rubbish on the curb and the horse and buggy came to collect it. Modern trucks have replaced the horse and buggy, but the process for collecting waste is much the same. To cut down on noise, stench and traffic congestion associated with the current process, the City of Sydney is working on a new waste system for new buildings and high traffic areas. The city already relied on advanced treatment of household garbage to extract every bit of recycling it can, recovering two-thirds of waste it generated. The city is now removing new technologies that can do even better, converting non-recyclable waste to energy to help power the local area is a major goal. Over 90% of the local area's household garbage could be sent for treatment and turned into gas to help provide renewable energy. This renewable energy could be used to power the city's tri-generation network. This interim waste strategy explains how the city of Sydney is meeting 2014 targets for dealing with waste in a more sustainable way and looks at ways of establishing and achieving long-term targets of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The City of Sydney is on track to meet the NSW government's waste avoidance and resource recovery target of 60% diversion of domestic waste away from landfill by 2014. The figures from our waste contractors indicate the city's resource recovery recycling rate is already achieving this level. The city will likely exceed the 2014 target by encouraging and supporting the domestic recycling, collecting garden organic waste, processing garbage with advanced waste treatment to produce compost, meaning no domestic waste goes direct to landfill, using programs that deal with specific items such as e-waste, household hazardous materials, white goods, and household cleanup waste. The aspect of energy management, Sydney did a great job. The city of Sydney generates almost 20% of their energy needs from renewable sources every day. Here's how they do it. First, by turning gas into electricity through a process known as cogeneration. They turn waste between gas, which is known as biogas, into electricity to help power their wastewater treatment plants. Biogas is a waste product of the waste treatment process. The biogas is captured and converted into electricity through combustion technology. They have cogeneration units at several wastewater treatment plants and water recycling plants. Second is the water power, which is known as hydroelectricity. They are producing hydroelectricity from their North Head Wastewater Treatment Plant. Treated wastewater passes down a large drop shaft on its way to a deep ocean outfall. This energy is captured by a hydroelectricity generator. Hydroelectricity is also used as Wadorona water filtration plant and on the Waragamba to prospect reservoir pipeline. Third 
the solar photovoltaic and solar hot water. They have a 60 kilowatt solar electric system on the roof of their Port Hill office building. The solar system provides power for most of their office lights. Solar hot water system also installed at many of their office buildings. I'll be talking about is green building. Green building can be defined as a sustainable green structure which is using the process is environmental friendly and resources efficient. Green buildings are basically constructed for the needs in reducing the impact of the development of built environment to human health and the earth. As for this oral presentation, we have chosen Sydney as the future city for our discussion. The most representative current green building in Sydney would definitely be the recent built office tower, which is named as the One Black Street. It is an ecologically sustainable development in Sydney. The green features of this building included a basement-switch plant which recycles the waste water, the use of a full double skin for cake with external rivers for its needs in energy conservation, and also a full height atrium which allows maximum sunlight to reach each level of the building. But what makes a good green building? The following categories must be, sh must be shown to be taken account in making a good building, such as the water management, energy conservation, indoor environment, quality, greenery and emissions. Sydney is definitely a developing city in green technologies. First of all, the Sydney City Council has been planning on cutting down the carbon footprint in the city by setting a target of reducing the greenhouse gas emission by 70% below 2006 by 2030. It has also drafted a Renewable Energy Master Plan, which will provide up to 30% of the energy demand from carbon-free renewable electricity for the city. Since Sydney is a sunny city, solar power has directly become a substitution. Certain organizations have already been planning on installing solar panels in up to 30 buildings in the city. It will be the biggest building mounted solar panel program in Australia and it is, it's estimated to cut down 2,000 tons of carbon emission per year. LED light which uses 40% less electricity than normal bulbs will also be used for building lighting system and street light. The city has planned to replace 6,500 lights with LED over the next three years. Next will be the greenery of the city buildings. Green roofs and walls have been fully supported by the city as it will help in the growth of different types of plants on vertical walls, making them part of the green buildings. Advantages of having these green roofs and walls are they can help to remove the carbon dioxide and harmful pollutants from the atmosphere. They also help to lower down the urban heat island effect and reduce energy use from air conditioner. According to the Greening Sydney Plan, privately owned land makes up to 62% of the city of Sydney but only contribute 42% to the urban canopy. Because of this, the city is currently working with private property owners to help in making most of their space by adding some greenery to their buildings. Greening Sydney Plan has also set a target of increasing the canopy cover of 50% by 2030 and 75% by 2050. From this, it will increase its overall urban canopy and deliver environmental, economic and social benefits to the city. Efficient and organized water management is also important in a complete green building. For example, a basement sewage plant that has been installed to the green building on Black Street in Sydney, which has successfully recycled 90% of the wastewater produced from the building's operation. In the future, the city of Sydney will be working on improving the way water being used in buildings and operations. One of the plans is to deliver 30% of the city's water demand from recycled water by 2030. Australia has been working on their technologies and facilities which are possible to treat wastewater to its highest standard. The technologies and facilities the government have been developing included membrane filtration and sewage plants. These, fac these facilities are hopefully to be installed into the built environment in the coming years. Developments such as Rose Hill in MSW has have also been implementing a dual pipe system that delivers both portable and recycled water to the sustainable green buildings. In this system, recycled water will be used to in flushing water toilets, washing cars, and watering purposes. This apparently Sydney has a, has a high potential in becoming a greener city in the future, 
which is fast growing development in green, te green technologies to the built environment. Thank you. The community of Sydney lives with a variety of natural and technological hazards. The more common hazards are floods, sea wind storms, and bushfires. With other events such as exotic animal disease, major aircraft crashes, and earthquakes are possible. Most incidents are handled using standard procedures. However, if an event requires a significant and coordinated response, then this term an emergency. The New South Wales government acknowledges the inevitable nature of emergencies and their social, economic, and environmental consequences. Accordingly, recognizes the need for coordination response by all agencies having roles or responsibilities in such emergencies. A number of Acts of Parliament set out the duties and responsibilities of the emergency services. The State Emergency and Rescue Management Act, as amended, is an act that provides the legislative basis for the coordination of emergency preparedness, response and recovery operations. A key element of emergency management planning in Sydney is the Emergency Management Plan, which is known as EM Plan. The objective of EM Plan is to ensure a coordinated responses by all agencies having responsibilities and functioning in emergencies. The function of EM Plan is to identify the combat agency primarily responsible for responding to the emergency, and specify the task to be performed by all agencies in the event of an emergency. Next, provide for the coordination of the activities of other agencies in, the, in support of the combat agencies. And last but not least, specify the responsibilities of the minister in the state, region, or local emergency operators, controllers. Finally, in Sydney, there is an emergency management committee established at state, region, and local government levels. The minister appoints the chairperson of the state emergency management committee. Regional Emergency Operation Controller chair the Regional Emergency Management Committees and Local Government Council provide chairperson for the local committees. Membership includes the Head of Emergency Service Organisation at each level and representative of the functional areas. Level, the Department of Infrastructure, Planning and Natural Resources, the Department of Local Government, the Premier Department and Treasury also represented. Functional areas are not represented at local government level unless the structures extend to that level.